You need to know this. When the enemy attacks the people of God, he has got underlying aims. He's got a aim for your life. He's got a aim for your family. He's got a aim for this church. The devil has aims for America. The devil has aims for this world. Please know he's a strategist. Don't think it's all happening by chance. And he's looking for fools that will run with his vision. So if you've got your Bible, would you turn to 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Would you turn in your Bibles then to Ephesians chapter 6? Just go right from Corinthians, Second Corinthians. Just keep going right. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may, may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And we live in an evil day. And having done all, to stand. I call this message this morning, It is Time for an intelligence briefing, part two. It is time for an intelligence briefing, part two. I'm sure you're like me, you've heard people say, ignorance is bliss. You ever heard that statement? Mm -hmm. Ignorance is bliss. Well, I'm here to tell you when it comes to spiritual matters, ignorance is not bliss. Amen? Mm -hmm. In fact, I would say quite the opposite. Ignorance is defined as this by the dictionary. It's a lack of knowledge. It's a lack of understanding. It's a lack of information. It's a lack of education. And it's a lack of awareness. I want to tell you that those things should not relate to a believer. We should know what's going on. We should be informed in regard to truth and what's happening. Uh, ignorance in scripture is often associated with darkness and also with deception. And that might explain why ignorance is sometimes described as being in the dark about something. Have you ever heard that? You know, I feel like I'm in the dark about something. It means you're kind of ignorant of it. Okay? We should take notice of the instruction in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, and it says, be not ignorant. Brother, sister, that applies to you and me. We should not be ignorant. The Puritan uh, Thomas Watson once said, Ignorance is Satan's stronghold. Ignorance is Satan's stronghold. The reason is, brother, sister, enlightenment removes ignorance. When light shines, then men are no longer in ignorance or deceived, but know exactly what's happening and they know what they're doing. That's why the Bible tells us that it's better not to know than to know and rebel. Because there was a time where the Lord winked at the ignorance of the Gentiles before the cross. He, he realized that they didn't know. But for us who know, and the more that you know, the more is actually expected of you. Well, an army that is ignorant of its enemy or its enemy's ability and strategy is incompetent and unprepared for the battle. An army that underestimates its en enemy is destined for failure. If you underestimate the enemy, I can assure you, you will get walloped. I'm telling you, today, this morning, we are in a battle. We are in a battle and we are actually fighting an enemy, a real enemy. Not a visible enemy, but an enemy. And I'm telling you, if you are ignorant of that enemy and how he functions, 
you could very well end up on the ropes or on the broad of your back. And I want to say this, it's a foolish thing to underestimate your enemy. Charles Spurgeon once said this, Foolish persons are easily entrapped. If you have ever watched boxing on the television or have you ever seen a boxing match, what happens to a boxer when he lets his paws drop? I'm telling you, you watch the good boxers. They box like this here. They keep their paws up and the, whether they're on the front foot or the back foot, they've got their paws up, not just because they're thinking about the next move, but also to protect themselves. Rather than hitting their face, they end up hitting their gloves or whatever. The terrorists in Northern Ireland used to mock us police officers and say this. We just have to be lucky once. You have to be lucky every day. Basically, the very day that you drop your guard could be the day that we stick a car bomb under your car seat and you're gone. That's why every day in life, when I was in the police, I would check under my car for booby trap bombs. I would go to the grocery store, check under the car whenever I got back into it. Go to play soccer. Um, sometimes when I knew people were watching me, and of course you can imagine you're in a town, you see somebody checking under their car, police officer, soldier, prison officer. So what you had to do, you have to, you had to always be very discreet. What I would do is I would get into the car and then drop my keys. Of course, I made sure that there wasn't a drain there or something. My keys were going to disappear. But I would drop my keys and then look under to see if there was anything untoward under, under my car seat. Every day. Sometimes numerous times a day. Because you cannot afford to let your guard drop when you're dealing with an enemy. You say, well, that, that sounds like you were paranoid. No. I would say that was vigilance. Mm -hmm. Okay? Right. And, you know, I've heard people say, well, you must have been on your nerves. And I'm like, the only way I can describe it is, is whenever you get into a car and you put your seatbelt on, are you being paranoid putting your seatbelt on? No. Does it become a habit? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, most of the time you probably don't even think about it. Would you agree? It just becomes habit. Right. Checking under my car for booby trap bombs was a habit. Okay, so I'm just trying to say that just in case you misinterpret vigilance for paranoia or fear. Okay, um, General Patton, um, one of Aaron Brown's heroes. We sometimes banter each other which generals were best. So I'll throw a British general up, he'll throw an American general up. <laughs> uh -uh. Okay, so General Patton, and most of you know he was uh, a great general, a great American general in the Second World War. And he wisely said this, You shouldn't underestimate an enemy, but it is just as fatal to overestimate him. When it comes to spiritual warfare, information on the enemy is golden. Would you agree? We talked about it two weeks ago. It is so important to have classified information, quality information, accurate information on your enemy. It allows us to box smart, to recognize his schemes, and also deal with him accordingly. Um, I'll tell you another thing that, and this is where the devil gets a lot of us just because we can't actually literally see him. Most of his victories are just whispering in our ears. Would you agree? Like, there's no tangible voice. There's no audible voice. But why am I thinking like that? I mean, how often do you, do you feel that? Why am I thinking like that? I, that's not who I am. That's not who I want to be. I'm a Christian, whatever. A lot of time he just whispers in our ears. So we need to recognize, hold on. The enemy is whispering something to me that is untrue. It's not right. And I can tell you, you recognize it because it's normally lies. It's normally beating you down. It's normally leaving you to either feel hopeless or fearful, etc., etc., lustful. You know what I'm talking about. So, 
we need to understand how our enemy works. Uh, one of the things, if you want to get a good general grasp of the enemy, is study all the enemies of God in the Scripture. Look in the Old Testament to how the enemies of God functioned, how they operated, what tools they used to try and defeat the people of God. And you'll start to see a pattern. So don't just study the devil in the Bible. Study the enemies of God who are basically puppets of the enemy. Okay, would you agree? When Goliath opened his big mouth and started to taunt the people of God, would you agree he was just a puppet on a string? The devil said, speak, and he spoke. The, the devil would say, do, and Goliath would do. He's only one of numerous enemies in this book. So I'm here to tell you it is very helpful to know the word of God. The Bible does not tell us to fear the devil, but it does tell us to be cautious, knowledgeable, and wary about the devil. We should definitely not be haphazard in our dealing with him. Ephesians 4.27 instructs us not to give place to the devil. 1 Peter 5 verses 8 through 9 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now this word vigilant is very interesting here. It means to keep awake and to be watchful. Can I ask you a question at this early stage of this message? Are you awake? Are you aware? Are you vigilant to the schemes of the enemy against you personally? Against your family? Ephesians 5.15 says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. And the word circumspectly there means very watchful. Very watchful, looking around you, being aware of where you're going and what you're doing. Now, an intelligence briefing is where we share and we receive information regarding the character, the aims, and the plans of the enemy. You need to know this. When the enemy attacks the people of God, he has got underlying aims. He's got a name for your life. He's got a name for your family. He's got a name for this church. He has got aims for America. Lance talked about this morning. The devil has aims for America. The devil has aims for this world. Please know he's a strategist. Don't think it's all happening by chance. And he's looking for fools that will run with his vision. But we run by another vision. Amen? Amen. By the way, we take our direction from somewhere else apart from the world. The last time that I spoke on this subject, as we had an intelligence briefing on our arch enemy, I listed a number of aims that the devil has against the people of God. I have exp expanded that list um, when I was down in Alabama, when I was traveling, I've been thinking about this, about the aims of the devil against us personally. But by outlining these aims, I hope that we can effectively address how to counteract the devil. It should make us more informed, more observant, and spiritually proactive. Um, thankfully, we do not need to speculate about what the devil's overriding agenda is. God shows us very clearly in the word of God what he is all about. So I want to start and read through these. And um, I want us just to reflect upon them for a moment. The ultimate aim of the devil is to come in between you and God. Would you agree? For the unbeliever, it is his aim to stop them truly knowing God. For the believer... It is his aim to stop them having real intimacy with God. Would that make sense? Mm -hmm. I mean, if he can come in between a human being and God, they go to hell. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Ultimately, his aim for mankind is to damn everybody to hell. Okay? The second thing is, if you're a believer, it's too late. Would you agree? The devil knows it's too late. If you're a child of God, it's too late. So then his aim in your life is, his number one aim, is to still come between you and God so that you cannot have true quality intimacy with the Lord. 
If you don't get that, then you're going to miss a mega nugget here this morning. Next thing here is, Satan is keen for you to work independent of God. He wants you to be driven by what you think or feel rather than what God directs in his word. If you are operating independent of the instruction of God's word, then you are operating independent of God. Next, the evil one wants to isolate the believer so that they are on their own and have nothing for anyone else. Would you agree? He wants you to be on your own, to be selfish. Oh, it's all about me. He wants to separate people like this from anyone or anything that is God ordained. That is why he wants to neglect you to neglect close fellowship. He wants to isolate you from your support base. And I'll share this, I'll support this by, you've heard me maybe share this, my friend Davy. Um, I always get a lot of nuggets from Davy, but Davy said this, there's a lot of sheep in Northern Ireland. Lisa, did you ever see any of the sheep over there? <laughs> I mean, guys, you look at all the hills to the left and the right, there's sheep here, sheep here, there's sheep everywhere. Yeah. But one thing that you'll notice, if you're familiar with sheep, is if you see one sheep off on its own, and all the rest of the sheep are here, Davy said there's something wrong with that sheep. It's natural for sheep to be among sheep. First of all, they feel safe. It's the thing that sheep do. Sheep want to be around sheep. So if you see a sheep that isn't in fellowship, is not around the sheep, then there's something wrong with that sheep. And I'm just saying that so we're mindful of it. That is an aim of the devil to get you separated from the sheep. Does that make sense? Next thing. The devil works hard to create division among the people of God. Divide and conquer are major tactics of the devil. By the way, the devil knows the power of unity and agreement. That explains why he works so hard for the destruction of marriage. Christian families, godly relationships, and solid churches. After all, Jesus said in Mark 3.25, If a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Brother, sister, it cannot stand. Don't try and work that out. It's a fact. It's a spiritual fact. The Bible also says, Mark those who cause division. Okay? So, I'm just telling you, that is another major tactic of the enemy to divide. Next, Satan wants to bully you. He is an intimidator. Look at the enemies of God in Scripture, and they were full of threats. Would you agree? I mean, it doesn't matter who you look at. They're always trying to, it can be with cunning words like, do you remember when Nehemiah was rebuilding the walls? He had some Bala and Tobiah. Remember when Job was going through the trial? It could be done with smooth religious words. But underneath you have to realize that the enemy wants to intimidate you. He wants to cause you to be fearful. What happened when Goliath run his mouth off on, on the playing field? He come and he's running his mouth off. How did Israel re respond to that? They were extremely fearful. Just words. Words from a big clown. That's all he was. Would you agree? He was just a big clown that was just being a puppet on a string. Intimidation's a big one for the devil. By the way, the devil hasn't changed. Hello? All around us today, that tactic is, tr they're trying to employ that tactic against this church. Intimidate us. Amen? Next. He earnestly wants to stop the light of God's word shining upon you. He knows that is the source of enlightenment, knowledge, and truth. This is where we find the grounds for our hope. This is where we get direction for our lives. I could list another 20 things here. This is where we get inspired. This is where we have faith arise within us, etc. There's, yeah. there's so much I could write after this here, but the devil knows that that book is a danger to him. That's why when you ask someone to come to church, it's such a battle. Yeah. 
If you've asked somebody to come tonight, there will be a battle with that. What is it that the devil fears? The God of this world hath blinded the minds of those who believe not. Why? Lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine unto them. The enemy is scared of this book. Next, Satan wants you to be self-centered instead of Christ-centered. He wants your welfare, feelings, and opinions to be important. I don't want to burst your bubble this morning. Well, in fact, I do. Uh, it doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what you feel. That can be very humbling for us. Well, my feelings are important. Baloney. You know what your heart's like? Do you, do you want a, a biblical analysis of your heart? You've got a bad heart. Oh, well, I got checked last week and the doctor said I had a good heart. Well, he's talking naturally about your heart. Your heart stinks. Your heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Amen. Desperately wicked. Amen. Not just wicked, desperately wicked. Yeah. And who can know it? Okay, so if that's burst your bubble, your bubble needs burst. Okay, would you agree? I'll say no more on that. Okay, next. He wants you to be captivated with the problem instead of the answer. Why? Why, does he, why would he even want that? Because when you're looking at the problem, you're looking at the problem. Okay, and the problem can be absolutely real. But you can be so captivated with a problem that you can't see any answer. Yeah. It just becomes hopeless. The more you look at that problem, the bigger it gets normally. And before you know it, you're just discouraged, you're weary. It's just like, what do I do? It's hopeless. I'm just telling you the aim of the devil is to get you to focus on the problem, the problem, the problem. Um, but I'm telling you, if I'm in a battle, it's like, I want to know what's the answer here. How do I get out of this trial? You know, and I've given the illustration before. It's like going to the doctor and you've got cancer. And you go to the doctor and he's like, I have bad news for you. You've got cancer. And, well, doctor, I mean, have you anything else? Well, you've got cancer. I'm just, it's, it's not looking good. You've got cancer. Well, I can tell you, Somewhere in there, you're like, well, doctor, have you any good news? I mean, is there any hope? Is there anything you can do for me? Would you agree? Yeah. And if he just kept talking about the cancer and he told you the history of it, and he just, it's just like, I can tell you what, it wouldn't feel too good. But if he told you you've got cancer, but I've got good news for you, A, B, or C. So I'm just telling you the devil never wants to give you the answer. He just wants to tell you how terrible you are and how terrible the situation is you're going through and just leave you depressed. Does that make sense? Yeah. Next, he wants you to get enchanted with the things of this world, with the temporal instead of the eternal. There's a world out there that's pulling at you and me like never before. I don't need to tell you, it's not just social media. It's just... The access that we have to information today with cell phones, with laptops, with iPads, you name it. We, we basically, it's just everything's right in our face today. So whatever interest you have, whatever, whatever hobby you have, whatever it is, you can have it until it's coming out of your ears. So I'm just here to tell you that the devil, one of his aims is to just make the world so attractive that spiritual things become secondary. Yeah. I have a question. Is there anything at the moment that is stealing your heart more than Christ? Is there anything out there that's grabbing you? It can be a person. It can be an interest. It could be work. It could be anything. It could be a sports team. It could be politics. You name it. It can be anything. Your temptation could be different from my temptation. My weakness could be different to your weakness. But I'm just telling you, whatever it is, it can grab your heart to such a degree that Christ is pushed into the background. That's the name of the devil. Next. Because the devil is a deceiver, he wants you to believe the lie about anything. 
He will convince you that right is wrong and wrong is right, that black is white and white is black, and everything is absolutely gray. We're living in a day where people don't even know what their gender is. They don't know what bathroom to walk into. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. Kyle, when, when you were at school, did you ever think you'd be seeing such a thing in your lifetime? No. Sherry, in your, when you were at school, did you ever think we would be here so quick? I'm telling you, I'm in shock. I still am in shock. It's like, are people out of their minds? I am here to tell you, the problem is the devil has deceived them. It is absolute folly and foolishness. All this transgender stuff is out of control. But please know this. I know we can blame this person, that person. The devil is behind this. This is how deceptive the devil is. Next. Because the devil is a destroyer, he wants to destroy everything holy, godly, wholesome, and righteous, and, and, and righteous quality, relationship, gifting you possess. You need to remember that he's a destroyer. So anything wholesome you have, anything quality within you, any gifting, any calling, his aim is to identify that within you and Take it, you out of the game. Um, I think it was about 10, 12 years, 10 years ago maybe, I spoke in Decatur about what your Achilles heel is, is what, sorry, what your quality is, is also your greatest Achilles heel. And by the way, this is another subject that I know I'm going to be preaching on again, because after that, every time I get a thought, I add it on to, to my list. So my list is so long, it's a bit like this here. My list gets longer and longer. It's a bit like the alcohol subject. Do I realize this could end up a couple of sermons? Or three or four sermons. But I'm telling you, whatever your quality is, is also your greatest weakness. You could be a very sensitive person to other people. But you also could be hypersensitive. You could be a very strong person and standing for truth, but... You could be ruthless. You could be a very gracious person. But you could be very weak. Do you understand? Some of the most gracious pastors I know are some of the weakest pastors I know. Mm -hmm. They let everything go. Everything goes under the carpet. Everything's under the carpet. And the carpet just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And everybody comes into the church going, what's going on here? There's something not right. Do you understand? I'm, I'm trying to help you this morning. The devil's aware of this. The devil knows what your talents are. The, ta the devil has a good idea what your calling is. He's not all known. But he, he's been about long enough to watch, to pick up mannerisms, to pick up qualities, to go, I need to take them out of the game on that issue. So what your calling is will be targeted by the devil. He's got you profiled. By the way, there's a whole drama today about profiling. People disagree with profiling. Well, hello? What, what do you expect the police to do whenever they're in an airport? They've got people profiled, and you know what? It works. Works. They know that a certain age group, a certain gender, has been doing this here, through this airport, th coming from this place to this place, and guess what? They have to. But the devil profiles you. He knows. He's watched you for years. He's watched your weak point. He knows exactly what your weak point is. Would you agree? Yeah. Some people, it's relationships. Some people, it's just their weakness is work. They work, and 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 the devil's got them so busy, they don't have time for the things of God. Others, it could be a hobby. Do you, do you understand? I'm just trying to help you this morning. We are... At an intelligence briefing here, we're talking about our enemy because we need to know him. Mm -hmm. The word says, be not ignorant. Right. So we're trying to establish what is his aim for us. And next, after that, how do we deal with that? Next. He wants to make your life a living hell on this earth. 
And honestly, if he can't get to you, he'll get to your marriage. If he can't get to your marriage, he'll get to your family. If he can't get to your family, he'll get to your best friends. If he can't get to your best friends, he'll get to your brothers and sisters in Christ. If he can't get to you through them, he'll get to you through people at work. If that doesn't work, he'll just get to you through your enemies. He will keep going until he gets somebody to annoy your happiness. Like if you think that you are going to be devoid of drama or opposition in this life, then there's something wrong. You're doing something wrong. But if you are a threat to the kingdom of darkness, he will get somebody along to resist you or to annoy you or to distract you. Does that make sense? We need to live in a real world here. We live in a world of imperfect people. And by the way, the devil can use you to annoy somebody else. Hello? I would safely say that all of us have been used by the devil to discourage somebody else. Huh? Do you know why? Because there's times we mean well, but the way we say something, the way we text something can be hurtful. Honestly, a lot of the times I, I hate texting because it seems so cold. Anybody else feel that? Yeah. Like I can answer like yes or okay. And it's like, is that it? <laughs> is that it? Is that all you're saying? Like, okay, there's something. Pastor Paul's got a problem with me. Okay. But do you understand how the devil works? The devil is so low. And he'll whisper in your ear after that. Blah, blah, blah. I don't need to say. You can think it up for yourself because (laughs) you you know what it's like. It can be an important relationship you're involved in. And they just give a yes or an okay. A lot of the time, there's sometimes... I've actually... In my new car, I actually can talk to the car and send text messages. So sometimes I just talk to the car and it says, it says, you have a text message from Ron Anderson. Do you want to reply? And, and I'll go, yes. And sometimes, um, you know, you, you just, it'll actually just send what you said, you know. But I'm telling you, texting can be so cold. And then, then you read it and like, oh, that sounded a bit cold, you know. Or somebody can ask you, like, what did you mean by that? And I'm like, I just meant okay. <laughs> Am I the only one that's ever experienced that? Now, can you imagine with social media and all that, it, it's like magnified a hundredfold. Huh? So that person hasn't talked to me like in two weeks. Well, maybe they haven't been on Facebook for two weeks. Do you know, I'm j- just saying that, that we live in a day where the enemy has so many tools to use. Let me go further. There's a lot of insecurity out there today. Do you know why? It's so easy to be unfaithful. So people are like, who's he talking to on Facebook today? Or who's he on Instagram with? Or Snapchat? There you see it? No, you don't. Or all the other stuff. I'm telling you that it is, if somebody wants to be unfaithful, it's never been a better day to be unfaithful. Everything is secret. Everything can be covered up. Uh, WhatsApp is apparently encrypted. Um, I'm just telling you, we live in a world (coughs) where the devil has got many channels to get at you and to get at me. Would you agree? So I'm telling you, it's good to know what the schemes of the enemy are. And if he wants to make your life hell, you have the ability to say, no devil, I'm not going there. Next, he wants you to walk in defeat. Um, I want to say this this morning. Each one of us this morning are either in the victory or in defeat. Which is it? Are you in the victory this morning or are you in defeat? Well, well, I'm holding my own, Pastor. I'm holding my own. Well, if you're holding your own, the devil's holding his own as well. Are you actually hurting the enemy this morning or is he hurting you? And I think what happens is because the devil is so much on the front foot attacking, attacking, attacking that we're so weak that we're just happy nearly to have neutrality with the devil. Well, devil, if you don't bother me, I'll not bother you. Okay? I just want an easy week. Okay? Just you leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. The devil's like, yes, suits me. Suits me. 
I'm telling you, neutrality is okay for the devil because his aim is to stop you having an impact and harming his kingdom. So neutrality is okay with him. But I'm telling you, you're either in defeat this morning or you're either in victory. It's one or the other. Next. It's the aim of the devil to get you to live in a condemned state so that you feel unworthy and unqualified to minister or to operate or even to be in the presence of God. It is impossible for faith to flourish in such a state. Would you agree? Now please be honest with me this morning. When you're in condemnation, when you're walking in guilt, do you feel, are you walking in faith? Do you feel that you're ready to go out and preach the gospel to every creature when you're walking in condemnation? When you feel unworthy? Okay, this is a big one, by the way. People beat themselves up and I'm not worthy. Um, They don't feel accepted before God. They don't feel welcome in His presence. And they're like, I just don't feel worthy to come to church. I don't feel qualified to come to church. But I have a question. What is your qualification to come into the presence of God? Can we establish it? Shout it out, Christine. We're his child. What, go- he done for us. what he's done for us. Jesus Christ. What else? Why are you qualified to be here this morning? His blood. His blood. Why are you qualified to be here today? Huh? You don't have a past. He's your advocate. Brother, sister, all of the above. We're his children. His children are welcome in his presence. Warts and all. I'm te- If you've come in this morning, you've failed the Lord in this last week, you're still welcome in his presence. That doesn't mean he's going to say, hey, high five, that I'm, I'm glad you did that. But you're in the very place he wants you because this is where he wants to talk to you, to minister to you, to expose and also to build up. And one thing I've learned is when he's exposing junk in my life, he's actually blessing me. And I don't know about you, but there's times I just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that I'm your child, that you won't let me get away with it. And by the way, if you're worse scenario, if you're under chastisement this morning, thank the Lord for it. If you're under conviction this morning, thank the Lord for it. Because there's many people out there, they don't even know what conviction and chastisement looks like. So I, I'm just telling you that we are welcome in his presence. The reason why people walk in condemnation and guilt and shame is because they haven't ran to him and got right with him. Or they don't realize that there's no condemnation for them that are in Christ. Those that walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Hallelujah. Um, he didn't come to condemn the world. He came to save us. So we need to see that his heart toward us is not to condemn us. He does not want to condemn you today. That's the devil. That's why it says in uh, Romans 8, Who is he that condemneth? Cameron mentioned this morning, because what has happened 2,000 years ago was satisfactory for God the Father to say, that's enough for me. So that, that would you agree that's a big one of the devil, condemnation? Uh guilt, shame, unworthiness and I'm telling you, here's one of the biggest mistakes that we all make we compare ourselves to other human beings That that is so wrong it's so wrong on a lot of levels one of the big thing is you look one way and you you realize, well I'm glad I'm not him you know, thank God I'm not him I'm better than him and then pride starts to rise up and then you look to the right and you see somebody who's more alive and active and you're then you feel unworthy. Do you understand? The devil will get you whatever way he can get you. If he can't get you this way, he'll get you that way. He'll either lift you up or knock you down. What are, and you know that which one's he gonna do? Whatever works. Whatever works. Um I'm just telling you that we need to always be on our guard. We need to know the grounds of why we can come in with a confidence today. 
We, we need to know. If you know that I'm not worthy, but he is worthy, and my faith is built exclusively upon him, and when, not if, when I sin, when I fail, when I come short, that I, I have an open heaven with him and just say, sorry, Lord. Then I can tell you that can get rid of a lot of condemnation. When I was a young believer, I struggled with condemnation, with guilt, with shame. And then you would come under a rip-roaring message, and it's like, oh boy, <laughs> oh dear me. I'm not like everybody around me. Like I felt like the preacher's perfect, and everybody around me's perfect, and here's me, I've been struggling with this sin all week. And the devil, boy, did the devil beat me up. And you would just leave, and you just wanted to get out. And it was because not because the preacher was wrong or the people were wrong, but I was wrong. I was listening to the wrong voice. That dirty, stinking devil was taking advantage of my ignorance. But the more that I've got to learn about the Word of God, the more that I've got to learn about the heart of God, the more that I've realized that we all, like sheep, have gone astray, the more that I have learned that a righteous man falleth seven times, but he gets up an eighth time. Hallelujah. That the more I've learned that, lo, I'm with you. Jesus said, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end. Hallelujah. The more I've learned that I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Hallelujah. I've realized, you know what? I can come in today with confidence in him. Amen. Devil, go to hell. Amen. Devil, shut your mouth up. Amen. Devil, you're a liar. Devil, you're a loser. Devil, you're stupid. Do you understand? That, that, that's where you fight back and say, no, I'm not going there. But please, that's why we need Bible studies. That's why we need to be under the Word. Because we need to know what God says on every one of these issues. Amen? Amen. The devil wants to wear you down with things. He wants to burn you out with the cares of this life. He wants to overload you so that you are impotent. This is a subtle one, would you agree? Like The devil can have you burnt out with the work of God. The devil can have you burnt out with family, just, just being a family person. The devil can have you burnt out with responsibilities in life, work. You just Can anybody identify with this one? The devil can just burn you out. And he sees whenever you're burnt out. Because when you're burnt out, you tend to drop your guard. And when you drop your guard, guess what happens? Boom. Just at the moment you didn't need a thump, you get a thump. So I'm telling you, be careful of burnout. How do you avoid burnout? Pace yourself. Pace yourself. I, at school, I, my distance was 1,500 meters. 800 meters, 1,500 meters. And 400 meters. I, I just, that was my distance. Okay? And always, like my brother and me, we always paced ourselves. Okay? So we kind of, we knew the distance, so we didn't sprint the first lap. But we watched guys doing that. So my brother and me were normally shoulder to shoulder because we were so competitive. Like, literally, we, there's no way I hated him beating me or <laughs> like I didn't leave it, live it down for a whole week or whatever. And vice versa, like I would just taunt him like and he would taunt me. But if he didn't win the 400, I won the 400. If he didn't win the 800, I won the 800. If he didn't win the 1500 meter, I won the 1500. We were just so competitive and we pushed ourselves beyond probably our normal whatever abilities. But what I'm saying is what was important to winning those distances wasn't how fast you started. It was getting into a, a, a steady pace that you could keep going and you knew the distance and you knew what pace you had to run at. Christian, that's smart when it comes to the Christian walk. Don't burn yourself out. Don't sprint off and then what a lot of the guys, like the second lap, they're going backwards. Like, and we just went, so they were way ahead and it's like, let them go, let them go. Second lap, we're going to take it. And suddenly you're just, you're just at your steady pace. You just go past them. Next minute, the third lap, they're like at the side. Go, <laughs> Why? They burnt themselves out. They were foolish. 
I'm, I'm telling you, when it comes to this Christian walk, you need to piss yourself. Don't overload yourself to the degree where it's overwhelming. When it's overwhelming, take time out. Just say, listen, that can wait. That can wait. That can wait. It's okay. That's not being lazy. That's being smart. And that's why between us, we have to have that transparency. Um, there's times that I feel it. I feel, I just feel like burnout. I, I, I just feel I need time out here. And I'm going to be honest, that was the main reason that I went down to um, a Dulham house. I just knew I needed a few days, recharge the batteries, refresh, and then I come back and I was just ready. I was excited. I was ready for the battle. Can anybody else relate to that? Does anybody else feel that? Has anybody else been through that where you just feel weary, tired, burnt out, or whatever, and you just know you need to take your foot off the pedal and just come to rest and take time out? Okay. Would you agree that the devil's aim is to burn you out? Okay. So please know that. Please think about that. Next. He wants you to be in bondage. He wants to pull you down with the chains of sin. I can tell you, please know this, sin is attractive to your flesh. Don't wonder, why am I thinking like that? Your flesh is a dirt bag. And your flesh is the same flesh that was there before you got born again. Now, what was your flesh like before you got born again? Be honest. Brian, what was your flesh like? What's your flesh like now? Is it any better? Did your flesh get suddenly sanctified whenever you get born again? Okay. <laughs> when, when Jesus says, take up your cross daily, when Paul says, die daily, what does he want to die? Your flesh. Why does he want your flesh to die? Okay. So are you with me? That don't be shocked by the vulgarity and the depravity of your flesh because your flesh will be nothing else but that. There's a day coming where you're going to be perfected, okay? We're just not there yet. There's a day coming where your whole triune being is going to be perfected. You're going to think nothing but holy thoughts. You're going to do nothing but godly holy deeds. Sin is not going to be an option anymore. But in this life, and I want to say this, and please hear me carefully. In this life, sin is an option. Brother, sister, sin is an option. It's not a good option. But would you agree, in this life, until you see Jesus, sin is an option every day. But obeying God is also an option. So this is the warfare that we have. So I'm just here to tell you, if you're struggling with sin, that's because your flesh, the devil ministers into your flesh, the Holy Ghost ministered onto your spirit. So whichever voice you submit yourself to is what you become. Whichever, you have two natures, two men in here, the old man, the new man. Mm -hmm. Whichever man you feed will be strongest. Mm -hmm. Feed your spiritual man, he's going to be strongest. Feed your carnal man, he's going to be strongest. Mm -hmm. And he said, how could a believer do that? They've got a flesh. They're feeding their flesh. And I'm telling you, you have the ability to murder you have the ab ability to fornicate or commit adultery because you've got a flesh in there. The only thing that stops you doing that is the Spirit of God within you. So I'm telling you, the devil knows that. So the devil, why does the devil hit you with the same sins every time? It you ever works. notice that? It works. <laughs> hey, please be honest. I, I mean, is it a fresh sin every day or is there a bit of a habit with the same sin just keeps coming up, keeps coming up? Be honest. Who struggles with, like, there's, there's main sins that the devil hits you with. Who struggles with that? Amen? Okay. Well, the devil knows what your weak point is. He remembers you in the world when you were a complete fool. And he knows that there is a potential, a vulnerability to go back there. Yeah. And at key moments, there's even a desire. Like, but that's where you say, no, that's not who I am now. The new man in me is a new creature in Christ. Amen? I want to finish what we have here real quick. And then what I want to look at next week is, God willing, so how do we successfully respond to all this? 
That's what I want to look at next week. The next thing is he wants you to be a victim rather than a victor. Can anybody relate to that? He wants you to, like, poor me. Do you realize what they said to me? Do you realize what he done to me? So the, the, the devil's aim is to make you a victim where you are, where it's, it's all about your feelings and your, like, th- this is so awful. How did she do that to me? Does she realize who she's talking to? Or he? Huh? Like, I'm, I'm not going to take that. Nobody's going to talk to me like that. But you know what I'm saying is, it is so easy to go down that road, but I'm telling you, the devil knows if he can make you a victim, he's defining who you are. Question, is a Christian a victim? No. Is a Christian a victor? Yes. Amen. Amen. What have we got victory over? The devil, the world, and the flesh. Amen. But that is an ongoing daily victory. Amen? Amen. It's not a, like the one-off victory has been won, but the implementation of that is an everyday battle. Yes. So I'm here to tell you, on the authority of God's word, you are not a victim. You are an overcomer. You are more than a conqueror. You're a child of God. You're a king. You're a priest. You carry authority. That's not who you are. Amen? Next. Satan functions best in secrecy. He loves the dark. Amen? He thrives on our our ignorance. He wants you to function there in secret. In fact, the word occult actually means to keep hidden or to keep secret. Openness and transparency blows this apart. Let me give an example. Christine got up today. She was open. She was transparent. Guess who got defeated today? Guess who won? God won. We won. Christine won. I'm just telling you that we work in a different realm to the world. See, the world would say, oh, that's crazy. But that's who we are. We're family. We love each other. Amen? Yes, we, we do not intentionally want to hurt our brothers and sisters. Yes. And we should be sensitive. We should have a heart toward our brother and our sister. So I'm just telling you, when it comes, when it comes to secrecy, that is one of the greatest tools that the enemy has. If you're holding something against a brother or sister, and you're not bringing it out in the open, the devil's winning. Mm. Okay, so w- w- so say I have an issue with Les, and say that I don't say anything to Les. I, I don't do the biblical thing. What's the biblical thing if I have got an issue with him? What if he has got an issue with me? Okay, both. See, people say, oh, well, he's got an issue with me. He needs to come to me. W- it, the Bible covers both. If I've got an issue with him or he's got an issue with me, even if he doesn't come to me, it's my obligation to come and say, Les, I need to talk. What happens when you've got two godly believers talking? What what normally should happen when they, they bring it out into the open? First thing is the devil's exposed. Would you agree? So he could be making it like this to Les, but he could be making it like this to me. But as we start to open up and put our cards on the table, he realizes I love him and I realize he loves me. So I'm telling you, secrecy is a ginormous tool of the enemy. What happens is then most people who are tormented in their minds are because of this issue. This issue is it. Their minds are tormented because they haven't been open and transparent. They haven't brought it into the light. Now, if I brought it into the light, unless I don't receive it, I'm free. Is he free? Do you understand? So do you understand how it works? If he, him and me end up being reconciled and, and, and we're hugging each other, and I'll tell you what, the only loser is the devil. So I'm here to tell you that secrecy is a ginormous tool. Don't hold grudges, sort it out, get it into the open, and then move on. Finally, he wants to abort the will of God for your life. He wants to stop you being who God wants you to be and doing what God wants you to do. The evil one targets the call of God upon us, the giftings we possess, the purposes we are here to accomplish, and resist the direction we are going. Amen? The, I'm telling you what, the devil wants to stop you. Please be aware of that. 
don't let him stop you. Um, you know, if he's telling, if God has told you to do A, B, and C, then with all your might, do A, B, and C. Even if you're struggling, even if it's like Gideon's army, faint yet pursuing, keep going. And if you can't keep going, just stand. We quoted it this morning, having done all, stand. Just say, I'm not lying down, I'm not going to be on the ropes here, I am going to keep going, or I'm just going to stand. Devil, no way, no way, not on my watch. Listen, hopefully this has helped you this morning, because there's some of this, as we started to get into it two weeks ago, this thing just started to open up to me. I'm on the plane. God's giving me thoughts. I'm in Alabama and I'm writing it down. I'm putting it on my cell phone because I feel that we're having an intelligence briefing and we need to know what we're dealing with. Mm-hmm. Next week, we're going to, how do we deal with all this? Okay. It may be a week. We may be on this for a couple of weeks, but um, I can tell you what, there's ways to overcome all of this. Let's pray. You know, What we're on this morning is really close in. I'm sure you'd agree. Um, I just want to ask you this morning, has the devil got in somewhere in your life? Any of these issues, has the devil got in and got a victory in your life? Is it an ongoing victory? Or is it something that you've got a victory over? Either you're winning or the devil's winning. But I'm here to tell you that you this morning can get a victory just by saying no to the enemy and yes to God. It's just whatever burden, whatever tactic the enemy's using. Because for one person, it'll be one thing. To another person, it'll be another thing. I'm just encouraging you this morning, leave it at the feet of Jesus. Just ask for his strength to overcome whatever that issue is. Father, we realize that we are in a war zone. We realize that we are the target of the enemy. Lord, as our faces differ, so do the things that uh, hit us and affect us and even knock us down, O God. Lord, I pray that whatever that tactic that the enemy is using against each individual in this house is, I pray that, Lord, that you would give us the ability not only to counteract it, but also to defeat the enemy. Lord, I believe there's a place of victory in each one of these attacks. So I pray that you would help us identify how we need to overcome these and just give us a boldness, Lord, to stand up like David stood up against Goliath and said, how dare this uncircumcised Philistine defy the armies of the living God? I pray there would just be a a righteous boldness rise up on every believer. And Lord, we pray this in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Let's stand this morning.